So um, uh, I study the visual control of human walking. And recently, I've been thinking a lot about what I consider to be one of the central ideas to the dynamic walking approach, which is that uh, we humans achieve the incredible efficiency that we do uh, by exploiting the basic biomechanical structure of bipedal gait. So that idea has been used to explain the efficiency of uh, human walking in obstacle-free environments. So I'm trying to see if that same idea can be used to investigate the visual control of walking in complex, cluttered environments that require visual control. So in order to do this, I uh, developed a experimental setup that simulates walking over rough terrain. So basically there's a large projector that displayed a bunch of blue squares of light on the ground. The projector was synced to a motion capture system so that if you step on any of these projected obstacles, they would light up, play a sound, and log as a collision. So the subject's task is really straightforward. <coughs> Just walk from one end of the room to the other and don't step on any of the blue projected obstacles. Um, so what I want to see is how well are people exploiting their biomechanical structure when they perform this task. So as we know, uh, the key idea that explains the way that we're able to walk as efficiently as we do is that we're essentially inverted pendulums during the single support phase of gait. So to see how well people are exploiting that pendulum structure, I built up a uh, model of an idealized three-dimensional uh, passive uh, inverted pendulum in math labs, and then fed in the initial position and velocity of the subject center of mass at the beginning of each step, and then let it go. So the red line here is the actual trajectory of the subject center of mass during a step. The blue line is the trajectory of the passively falling three-dimensional inverted pendulum. So then you apply that measurement to each step, and then you measure the error between the two trajectories. Uh, so this is a 2D image, but of course it's being done in three dimensions. Um, so the idea is the more similar the subject's center of mass trajectory is to the passively falling pendulum, the more similar the movements are to, uh, to a past pendulum. Um, so the more efficiently they're exploiting their biomechanical structure when they're walking through the room. So what I want to know is when people are doing the visually guided task I showed earlier, how is the visual information contributing to their ability to exploit that pendulum structure? So the way you figure that out is you manipulate the visual information. So I told the projector, so people did the same task, so now I told the projector to only display obstacles when they're within a certain distance of the subject's position as they walk through the room. So people did this task in a variety of these different visibility windows. In the largest, they could see five step lengths ahead of them as they did the task. In the smallest, they could only see one step length in advance as they walked through this uh, simulated, complicated terrain. So if people are using visual information about their upcoming path to choose footholds that allow them to exploit their biomechanical structure, and as you start to remove the visual information and remove the um, ability to plan ahead, you should see them lose their ability to exploit that pendulum structure. So, I don't know why the video stopped. Oh, no. Ha. Oh, boy. That's right for you. Yeah. Very good idea. That's old man. Okay. Oh. Ha. Results. So, um, well, they will be done. <laughs> so this is going to show the error between that predicted center of mass trajectory of the ide idealized uh, passive pendulum and the actual subject's center of mass trajectory during a step. Y-axis is the endpoint error normalized by walking in an optical precondition. X-axis is uh, the visual size of the visual window, how far ahead they can see as they perform this task. The full vision condition, you can see the entire field, field of obstacles. Uh, you see the number is a little bit over one. As you start going back, you see there really isn't much of an effect as you start to remove the visual information on this measure until you get to about two step lengths. And then you see a large increase in that error curve. So what this tells me is that if people have two or more step lengths of visual information as they're walking through this complicated terrain, they're able to exploit their biomechanical structure as efficiently as they do when they're walking with full, unconstrained vision. So, essentially what this says is with people are walking over complicated terrain, visual information about the upcoming path is used to select footholds that allow you to exploit your biomechanical structure in order to walk in, in order to approximate the level of efficiency you can walk with in an optical-free environment. 
so I'm right out of time, but can somebody please ask me what's special about two-step links? It's a great question. So imagine you're trying to walk and hit this little yellow circle. So as you know, the best way to do that is to set up the previous step, put your foot in a spot that's going to allow you to fall forward ballistically in order to hit that uh, target. Basically, falling passively, you get a lot of movement for free, which is what we like. So what you want to know, if you're looking at the visual control, is what is it that defines that passive trajectory, and, what is, and when are those determinants available to the control of the subject? <coughs> now, there's two things that determine that trajectory. There's the location of the planted foot, and there's the initial position and velocity of the center of mass relative to that planted foot. So if you're walking in that complicated environment in those visual manipulations, in the one step length condition where you can only see one step length ahead of them, you don't get to see that part of the terrain until you're already halfway through that ballistic trajectory. Both of the determinants of, those, of that trajectory are already set, so there's nothing you can do to adjust your center of mass except for some sort of comp, you know, costly muscle thing. In one and a half step length condition, you may be a little bit better off, you may be able to start tailoring that push off course. But it's not until you have two or more step lengths of visual information that you can start to take control over the things that are going to determine the path and trajectory of your center of mass during the step. You can shift the location of that kind of foot to adjust the base of that pendulum. You can tailor the push off course of that, of that at the end of the double support phase in order to tailor the initial conditions of your center of mass relative to that kind of foot. So this is the last slide. And this is the, the take home message here, which is that as long as you have two or more step lengths of visual information about your upcoming path. Get all of the information that you need to maximally, fully exploit the basic biomechanical forces that are inherent to bipedal walking in order to approximate the level of efficiency you can walk with in walking in a flat, obstacle-free environment. So, thank you. Um, uh, Sean Carver, a research scientist in my lab, uh, wrote a paper that I happen to be on that he really did the work describing a two-step correction strategy for running, where, if you, in other words, what the minimum number of steps that it requires to recover from perturbation laterally. And I wonder if, uh, I know this is walking, the biomechanics are different, but basically, if you want to set to the side and then remain upright afterwards, you have to first step to the left, then step to the right, and then you can be upright. You can't ever do less than that. And I wonder if the I think, I think that there is, there is a similar thing going on. Um, I mean, walking is different, but you know, if you're talking about moving ballistically, I mean, by place is going to be fairly ballistic. Uh, the the two-step length distance has cropped up in other areas of the research as well. I mean, in, in, you, know, you tend to look two-step lengths ahead when you're looking at gaze. You know, if, if an obstacle lights up two steps ahead, you're better walking over it. Um, so this number has shown up in, in many places, uh, but I think by looking at sort of the, the Pendulum kind of dynamics and, and, and running sort of the flight. Sort of the unit that's the, 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 the sagittal plane. Sorry, oh. the frontal plane. Being able to set to, to correct yourself, the, the frontal plane, not the sagittal plane, hmm. it might determine your ability to you know, how many steps you need to do this position. Um, it's, it's possible. I mean, the, the, the stuff I show at the end is all just sort of conceptual hand waving. Um, I haven't really done much specific research on it, uh, but I mean. Mike, I do think two is a, is a sort of a magic number in this context, and I'd be interested to see the, the research on the running. So I don't believe in the inverted pendulum model. <laughs> okay. Does that uh, model, uh, would some other model like the spring mass walking model, would that change the results of pretty much? Oh, same? almost certainly. I mean, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm terrible at physics and mathematical modeling, so I did use the point mass inverted pendulum because that was the most complicated physical system I could figure out how to model. Uh, and I didn't think it was going to work because it is a really terrible model of, of walking. Um, but the results were fairly clean. So I think that even though it's probably not a very good model, uh, it's powerful enough that you can see sort of results if you're looking at if you're comparing it to people with these different visual conditions. If you had a more complex model, uh, like a spring mass model, you could probably get better results. But, you know, I, I don't know how to do that. What's that? I don't think so. What does it mean you don't believe it? Yeah, I mean that's basically all this is in, in, in this context.
It's what? just sort of, it's, it's the first thing I was able to do. One more question. So you, you show uh, an image of up, hit, up hit the terrain walking as a motivation at the beginning. And I wonder if you have some thoughts of uh, what, what would be the most efficient on the center of mass model when going uphill. Oh, um, that's, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I'm, I, I, I work in a psych lab, so talking about specific, complicated uh, biomechanical models is sort of over my head. Um, I know the basic, I know the basic biomechanic stuff. Um, I think that, you know, similar models apply to walking uphill versus downhill, you'd have to sort of push off harder. But um, I don't, I couldn't say past that. I mean, you, you, you can talk to other sort of more technically minded people if you want to get that sort of thing. So that's the last question. We need to uh, move on. Oh, the next. Nice.